This video is a review of the rigid rotor system in quantum mechanics. So we start with the rigid rotor model system. We've got two atoms uh, of mass 1 and mass 2. They're connected by some chemical bond at a distance r, and that r is fixed, thus the rigid and rigid rotor. And the potential energy is zero beyond the fact that it is restricted to remain at this distance r. So it is free to rotate around angular space. So our Hamiltonian is just going to be its kinetic energy minus h bar squared over 2 times reduced mass of the system times the Laplacian, which is the second derivative with respect to all spatial coordinates in Cartesian. And then this can also be expressed as the angular momentum operator squared over 2 times the moment of inertia. And these rotational operators, which we're going to be interested in for this system, are the total angular momentum squared, L squared, which is the part of the Laplacian which deals with only with the angular part when you transform to uh, spherical polar coordinates. Uh, the R derivatives drop out because R is a constant. And you have the Z component of angular momentum, the angular momentum around the Z axis. And the ideal coordinate system for a model system like this where we're working in terms of these angular rotation coordinates is uh, the spherical polar where we have the variables r, theta, and phi instead of x, y, and z, where r can go from 0 to infinity, distance from the origin. Theta is the angle from the z-axis going from 0 to pi. And then uh, phi is the angle around the x, y plane going up from 0 all the way to 2 pi. <clears throat> So solving for the energies, the distinct quantized energy levels you get for the rigid rotor, we get that they depend on some quantum number j, and they equal h bar squared over 2i times j times j plus 1. j might also be referred to as a lowercase script l as well. Those are, those are equivalent. And this can also be expressed as b times j times j plus 1, where b is a constant, which here would just be h bar squared over 2i. And we have a degeneracy in this system for every energy level with a quantum number of j, there are two j plus one levels. So going up from j equals zero, we have one, three, five, and seven energy levels as we go up in j. And the energy levels we can see are quadratically spaced apart. j is an integer which starts at zero and goes up from there. So this system is a nice model for explaining the microwave spectra of diatomic molecules. We have a selection rule for microwave spectroscopy or rotational spectroscopy that the change in the rotational quantum number j, or L, is plus or minus 1. So the energy change that occurs there between two levels is equal to the fre frequency of the photon absorbed times Planck's constant. And that frequency is going to be, as we saw, a difference in energy levels, which will be 2 times b uh, times j plus 1. So what this gives us is a bunch of lines in, the, in a rotational spectrum which are evenly spaced, uh, being in the microwave region based off of what the typical values of B are. So much smaller in energy than uh, vibrational energy levels. Um, we have also row vibrational spectroscopy. We have row vibrational energy levels where we're interested in both the vibrational energy and the rotational energy simultaneously. For row vibrational spectroscopy, we have the selection rule that for absorption, the change in the vibrational quantum number is plus one, and the change in the rotational quantum number is plus or minus one. And these values for nu and b are the same as they are for the harmonic oscillator and the rigid rotor, which are the two models for vibration and rotation, respectively. So you get an energy diagram which looks like this, where you have the farther spaced vibrational levels and the closer spaced rotational levels, evenly spaced for vibrations and quadratically spaced for, uh, for rotations. So this spectrum, the transitions allowed by these selection rules lead to this type of spectrum here where we have what's called a P branch and an R branch. The R branch is where delta J equals plus one. We're going up in rotational energy and the P branch is where delta J equals minus one. We're going down in rotational energy. And again, just like the microwave spectra, the spacing between uh, subsequent peaks is 2B in uh, in hertz or it's 2b bar in wave numbers and there's no note that there's no peak here at the vibrational frequency at the transition between uh, 
vibrational energy levels because J has to go up or down, thus we're missing the peak right there. We have uh, deviations away from this ideal behavior when you have interactions between rotation and vibration. So the rotor here, our rotating molecule, is not perfectly rigid. This bond length can change as the vibrational energy level changes. As you get to higher and higher vibrational energy levels, your bond length gets slightly longer, thus your moment of inertia goes up, and thus, as we can see from the expression for B, the value of B goes down, thus our energy levels get a little bit closer together. And the way this works out, the way this works out in terms of these energy levels here is that the R branch gets a little bit closer together than the P branch if you find the differences in energies uh, using this rotation vibration interaction constant alpha here, which is an indication of how, kind of how much that bond length lengthens and this rotational constant decreases as you increase the vibrational level. Similarly, faster and faster rotation can also increase the bond length through centrifugal distortion. Um, you can, through perturbation theory, a technique which we'll see later, solve that you get at first order a uh, centrifugal distortion constant D, just like we have the uh, rigid rotor con rotational constant B, and this centrifugal distortion constant indicates how much the bond distorts and lengthens as you get to higher and higher rotational levels. So as J goes up, you also have the bond length going up, moment of inertia going up, and thus the rotation constant going down, and the energy levels will get spaced a little bit closer together as you go up. For the wave functions of the rigid rotor, those that satisfy h psi equals e psi for this system, they are actually the spherical harmonics, which appear in many other problems that have this same type of cylindrical symmetry. And they have a normalization constant, which depends on the two quantum numbers, L and M, L and, or J, as we might call it. L and J are the same thing. And then we have a Legendre polynomial, which depends on the values of L and M, and the variable in this case is cosine theta. So if you find a Legendre polynomial which depends on x, you would substitute in cosine of theta for x. And then the part which depends on, on phi, the azimuthal angle in the xy plane, we have a complex exponential e to the i m phi. So now our wave functions are complex. Uh, if you have a non-zero value of m, so you have to take care to uh, really watch when you're doing uh, complex conjugates that you do switch the sign on that i. Uh, these spherical harmonics are orthonormal to each other, and that means that if there is a two uh, different spherical harmonics, two different rigid rotor wave functions, and they have different values of j or m, so if j prime and m prime are not the same here, then you will get zero for this integral over all of angular space here. Whereas if j prime and m, if j and j prime are the same as well as m and m prime being the same, then you'll get one, these being normalized through this normalization constant. So both j and m have to have the same values for both of them in order for this integral to be non-zero. They are orthogonal to each other. For these angular momentum operators, these rotational operators that we have, they provide the two uh, eigenvalues uh, for our system based off of their different quantum numbers. So if we act on the, L on the wave function with the L squared operator, the eigenvalue we get back is h bar squared j times j plus one for j and m here. And for LZ, the Z component of angular momentum, acting on a spherical harmonic with J and M, you get the eigenvalue H bar M times the same spherical harmonic back. So these two eigenvalues here can distinguish which state we have by acting on LZ and L squared on a given spherical harmonic.